Hello, my name is Scott Shell. I'm the Extension Entomology Specialist at the University of Wyoming and today I'd like to talk to you about reducing the risk of purchasing uh, blister beetle contaminated hay. You might have uh, heard uh, of the news story that came out in January of 2020 about a large number of horses in Wisconsin that uh, uh, were poisoned by uh, blister beetle contaminated hay and so uh, certainly uh, this happens probably on smaller scales every year and, and I want to share with you some information that may help reduce the risk of that happening to your livestock or riding animals. If I mention any product names in this uh, presentation it is not an endorsement of the extension service. Blister beetles uh, is the common name for the family Meloidae. Uh, these are insects that uh, are relatively common across the United States, uh, but in that family there is a genus uh, called Epicotta that are uh, have a behavior of swarming on blooming plants uh, to mate and the females are more interested in eating and the males interested in mating and uh, they will uh, do that on alfalfa and other legumes uh, and so that's how they become a problem because uh, if they are harvested uh, with the hay they their body contains a, a poison The genus name Epicotta is the root of that is caught, which is uh, a meaning to burn, like cauterizing a wound. Only the cantharidin is the name of the poisonous chemical in the body fluids of the blister beetles, and it can blister skin and mucous membranes. Uh, it is secreted as a defense. Uh, uh, here you can see this blister beetle, uh, they can do what's called reflexive bleeding, and so if it was being attacked by a, a bird, or, or some other creature it could do that and then expose the, uh, the chemical to uh, what's attacking it. Uh, if you accidentally crush it uh, or brush against it and does that on your skin it can form a blister. It actually has medicinal uses uh, when purified uh, to be used to burn warts off of skin. Unfortunately, it doesn't break down easily and retains its caustic action even when dried. So if the blister beetles are crushed into the hay, uh, even if they fall out of it before it's made, it can contaminate the hay, but it definitely is a, a toxic chemical. The blister beetle species that cause problems in alfalfa hay utilize grasshopper egg pods for the uh, food for their larva. Uh, in our region they have a one-year life cycle uh, where the adult female will lay eggs and eggs hatch and that first instar as you can see down here in the lower left corner um, is, is uh, slender and, and tiny and mobile and they search out grasshopper egg pods that are buried in the surface of the soil and then dig into there and uh, will eat the eggs and, and molt and become uh, less mobile. They've found their food source. They don't have to be mobile anymore. And then we'll spend the winter as a pupa <clears throat> and we'll emerge the next year uh, in time to uh, uh, repeat the cycle. <clears throat> but again, uh, in, in that respect, they can be beneficial, but the, the problem with that is they can contaminate hay and their population surges when grasshopper populations are high. And so in years following grasshopper outbreaks, you have more problems with blister beetles because there are more of them that successfully found egg pods and, and survived and, and then uh, repeat the cycle. So uh, your population of blister beetles increases in those times. Here is just a picture of the late instar blister beetle larva uh, dug out of the ground with a grasshopper egg pod and showing the eggs, the brown cylindrical things, and then the two grubs uh, that were there. So uh, one of the strategies that uh, producers of hay can do to reduce the chances of blister beetles being in their fields is uh, grasshopper control. So fewer grasshoppers, fewer egg pods, fewer uh, uh, habitat for the blister beetle larva. Now these 
four blister beetles uh, are potentially the ones that would cause the most problem in our region. The striped species is the most toxic. It contains the most contheridin. No specimens have ever been collected in Wyoming, but there's no geographic barrier to them uh, getting here from, say, Nebraska or South Dakota where they're known to exist. But again, they're the most toxic. Uh, the, the two gray species are intermediate toxicity. So like say it would take more of those uh, to uh, um, uh, kill a horse than it would the number of striped uh, blister beetles. The black blister beetle is relatively common and I have had that submitted from uh, uh, hay that uh, was fed to horses here in Wyoming. Um, I, didn't know the origin of the hay uh, that these beetles came from, but again, the black blister beetle is relatively common in our state. It is most abundant in late summer, which makes sense because that's when most grasshopper egg pods uh, are, are available to their larva uh, to seek out. Uh, you often see them also, uh, congregating on uh, flowering weeds like goldenrod. That's a really uh, uh, favored plant for them. So weed control around alfalfa fields can and also help reduce uh, the uh, amount of blister beetles that may move into the field because they don't have the initial flowering weeds to attract them. Uh, I have had uh, people submit a pyrota species uh, of blister beetles. They are in the same family uh, and they superficially look similar to the striped but they don't uh, have the behavior of uh, gathering on uh, blooming legume plants in, in mass and so they are they are not considered a, a, a hay pest uh, at this point in time. How toxic are they? Uh, well, the blister beetles uh, say they vary with species on the amount of the contheridin toxin that they contain. Um, it has been shown in some scientific studies that uh, the amount of contheridin uh, necessary to kill a horse uh, is contained in 120 of the striped blister beetles. Uh, and so you can uh, probably, they are two to three times more toxic than the intermediate ones and probably about five times more toxic than the black ones. So it, it can take quite a few of them, but no amount of the contheridin is actually good to consume. It's, it's a pretty potent uh, blistering agent. Um, you, you also have other risk when you're feeding hay to horses. You know, the moldy hay can cause uh, uh, conditions uh, that uh, uh, can hurt the horse, uh, such as the heaves. Um, anaerobic conditions and moisture and that really tightly baled hay can actually uh, f get botulism toxin. I knew a lady lost a couple of horses t due to botulism. Um, uh, poisonous weeds can be accidentally harvested in the hay. Um, uh, in ingestion of twine or net wrap accidentally by uh, horses or other animals uh, certainly is a risk. You need to keep the risk of blister beetles in perspective with all the other risks that uh, come with feeding hay to animals. I mean, uh, very few people have the uh, pasture to uh, just have their animals graze naturally. So uh, we are uh, stuck with feeding hay and, and blister beetles, uh, yeah, that's one risk, but there are others uh, such as this photo uh, from the uh, University of Con Florida um, um, vet school of hay wrap that had been uh, removed from a horse's stomach. It is the behavior of the blister beetles that uh, make them uh, a hazard for our uh, animals in that uh, they will gather on those plants in mass and uh, again the, the beetles, you know, by themselves, uh, when they're just crawling around out on the plants are not really a hazard. Uh, you know, if, if a horse accidentally ate one out in a pasture, a highly unlikely occurrence, yeah, it would probably get some blisters, but wouldn't be killed by it. But they, because they swarm and get on the hay, and then that hay might be uh, harvested, and, and during that process, they are uh, crushed in there and contaminate the hay. That's where the real risk comes from. Uh, horses are more 
more sensitive to the toxin than our other common classes of livestock, but it's not good for any of them. As, uh, in my readings about the blister beetles, uh, uh, there are a few birds that seem to be able to tolerate eating them and a toad, uh, but uh, just about anything else except for some of the insect predators, uh, they are uh, uh, discouraged by that toxin that the blister beetles contain. So besides being more sensitive to it, I think it's also is how we feed hay. Often horses are fed in mangers uh, and if they're like my uh, two pasture pets uh, they lick their mangers clean and whereas uh, cattle a lot of times say a large round bale is unfolded out in a pasture they jostle around each other uh, uh, blister beetles that may be incorporated in the hay could fall out uh, and there's less chance of one cow getting uh, an entire lethal dose whereas if you had uh, uh, one flake of hay that was infested with uh, a mass of blister beetles and you threw it in a manger uh, you would uh, you know greatly increase the chance of uh, the horse being uh, injured by that now we don't generally feed a lot of hay on the ground to horses because there's another risk that can come from that the uh, sand colic they they can ingest the the particles of, of sand as they try to clean up the hay off of dirt and then that can cause issues too. Uh, it's also very difficult to search each flake of hay for blister beetles whether you know if they're the gray ones they're not very apparent the black ones uh, you know they're sm the smallest ones of the epicotta uh, they're still anywhere from three-eighths of an inch to maybe a, a half inch long and uh, again after they've been dried and run through the the machinery uh, and handled maybe fragments so it's not very practical to inspect every flake uh, down to the level uh, that would take for detection of blister beetles. Now you might think that uh, hay producers could, would just use insecticides to kill the blister beetles in the alfalfa before the harvest but it's not that simple. Uh, the insecticides labeled for blister beetles in alfalfa require a pre-harvest interval to allow the insecticide to dissipate before it's harvested. Um, and during that time period, more of these mobile pests can move into the field again after treatment. And also during that time, more of the alfalfa or other legume would come into bloom, making it even more attractive during that pre-harvest interval. Now you may not see the, the functional flight wings on the beetles because on most species they're folded up very neatly underneath the modified front wings that form a shield on their body, uh, but they are mobile and so that's how they can appear into a field uh, pretty rapidly. So ins insecticides really are not an answer, uh, at least not when you direct it at the blister beetles in the field. It might be a, uh, an option for producers to uh, use to reduce the grasshoppers around their fields so they don't provide that critical habitat of the, the, for the larva uh, and food for the larva by reducing the populations of grasshoppers. Now the other difficulty for hay producers to try to avoid uh, harvesting the hay with the blister beetles on it is the size and the speed at which uh, modern machinery goes through a field now. Uh, the, the it would be very difficult to spot say a swarm of these blister beetles while you're sitting up in the cab moving down the field at a, a rapid pace with a, a broad uh, machinery uh, header on there uh, it just is not very practical uh, to try to uh, you know prevent that you know the the best thing that they can do is time their harvest when there's very little bloom in the crop for especially for horse hay uh, because then the risk is greatly reduced. There's nothing to attract the blister beetles into the field at that point in time. To reduce the risk to your livestock or horses um, uh, from blister beetles, uh, 
it is best to buy hay harvested when the alfalfa or other legume is not in bloom, if that's available. Now, you know, beggars can't be choosers. Sometimes, you know, that's you may uh, not have a choice, and uh, cer certainly, uh, it is uh, can be difficult uh, to find hay in in certain years. That's part of the problem that happened with the people who uh, lost horses in Wisconsin uh, in. Uh, January of 2020 in that uh, local hay was not available and they bought hay from out-of-state sources uh, and, and certainly you know they were pretty much desperate for hay so they had to take what they could get. If you're buying hay from a hay broker ask where it was grown and examine it closely before you purchase it for any of the problems that we've talked about whether it's blister beetles or poisonous weeds, uh, debris, mold, those types of things. You know, generally for horse hay, you're paying a premium for it, and, and you have every right to ask the producer about harvest practices that they use to avoid crushing and incorporating blister beetles into their hay, and and they should try to answer them and and uh, provide answers that make sense. You know, essentially, they cannot fully guarantee that their uh, hay is blister beetle free if it has blooms and it is grown in the region of the U.S. where blister beetles are present. It's uh, just about impossible. But they can take lots of steps to reduce the risk and, and you as a hay buyer can also uh, buy your choices of, of hay uh, and, and reduce risk too. I think it's important for a hay consumer to know what steps a hay producer can take to reduce the risk of blister beetles. Uh, that way, you know, you can ask uh, potential uh, uh, suppliers of hay what steps they're taking and know the correct answers. Uh, number one, of course, is the harvest timing. You know, the the cuttings of hay that. Uh, uh, can be sold for horse hay to reduce the risk the most uh, from blister beetles would be ones where there's little or no bloom present in the field. Um, other steps that they can take is weed control around the field to prevent, prevent the blooming of weeds that attract the blister beetles such as goldenrod for the black blister beetle. Perform uh, grasshopper control around their fields. This reduces the larval habitat for the blister beetles and reduces their overall population. And, and then, of course, uh, conduct harvest with practices that reduce the crushing and, and uh, possible incorporation of beetles into the hay. If a producer of hay is uh, trying to harvest when there is some flowering going on in his field, uh, they can take a step that uh, reduces the possibility of crushing and uh, killing the blister beetle so they can crawl out of the, the hay after it's been cut. Uh, they will leave it after it's drying down. And the way they can do that is to open up the crimper or conditioners on their swathers and, and this will reduce the possibility of crushing the beetles into the hay. The downside to that for them is the longer time to dry hay and of course you know then it's out in the field longer, it could get rained on, those types of things. Certainly uh, there are uh, some downsides to that but it's also you know if, if they're um, selling a premium uh, hay for horses uh, taking steps to reduce that risk is, is probably worth it for them for the uh, price that they can charge. <laughs> Producers can also reduce the risk of blister beetles uh, uh, for horse hay by uh, taking special steps to the outer um, uh, swaths of their field because uh, a lot of times you open up a field by going around its circumference uh, with swather before you start going back and forth and in those paths uh, as you turn you'll crush the hay in those windrows and so even if you've opened up your crimper and are not crushing the beetles during the swathing if you drive over them while they're still in that hay you can crush them so uh, only selling the internal hay is also a good idea in that uh, the outer edges are more likely to have blister beetle swarms because they can move out of the fence rows and borrow ditches uh, where 
grasshopper eggs are most abundant and then also the weedy areas in those uh, uh, fence rows and bar ditches uh, with uh, goldenrod or amaranth those types of things that can attract uh, the blister beetles uh, you know that reduces risk so that interior hay is less likely to be infested with blister beetles and and so it, it would be worth a premium uh, that horse hay can bring. I think the number one thing that uh, a, a buyer of hay to reduce the risk of uh, having blister beetles is to uh, have the, the cutting of hay that they get uh, be done when there is little or no bloom in the field at all because it's uh, much more likely to have the swarms uh, in areas that uh, have uh, alfalfa and full bloom you know certainly you know when I was a kid we had dry land uh, mixed hay of alfalfa and crested wheatgrass and usually to maximize our tonnage we allowed that uh, alfalfa to be in in full bloom before we cut it but there is risk even with that uh, because you know it's that the flowering plants that attract the blister beetles into the uh, crop so trying to find hay without uh, that uh, is going to be a uh, high priority even if it means maybe not having the fine stemmed and leafy uh, cutting if it was allowed to go to bloom then uh, you know you might be better off with a coarser cutting that uh, doesn't have any bloom in it if you're trying to reduce your risk of blister beetles. More detailed information on blister beetles uh, can be found in an excellent bulletin from Kansas State University Extension Service called MF959 and you can probably do a Google search using those keyword terms or go to the uh, URL that is provided to you there uh, and, and read more detail about it. Um, you know they have a, a fine vet school at KSU and it was done in conjunction with them and it is really related to um, uh, the risk that blister beetles pose to horses. Uh, there's also some good information online like the Merck veterinary manual uh, about blister beetles and what the signs and symptoms are of uh, uh, intoxication uh, from the uh, blister beetle uh, toxin contheridin. So certainly, uh, and I'm willing to be contacted and try to answer any questions that uh, I perhaps didn't uh, during this presentation at my contact information below um, so with that you know uh, having uh, livestock and horses uh, you know we have to feed hay almost everybody doesn't have the pasture that uh, can allow the grazing animals to support themselves naturally uh, feeding on uh, standing vegetation so uh, hay comes with some risks but the more you know about it uh, the less the the risk can be for your livestock so thank you for your 